We're looking at the preparation for building the tabernacle, Exodus chapter 25, and we have worked through the first eight verses, and we were working on verse 9 when our time ran out last time. This is uppercase G on your outline, the arrangement, and I know I've covered a good bit of this, but I want to go back and start at the beginning of it so as to not pick up right in the middle of the thought. I don't know. I don't have your name. Oh, well, where am I? Okay. Jehovah would show them the pattern. Pattern means a model. A resemblance. For all the things that were to be made. Verse 9. According to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So they're going to have a model. Jehovah's going to give them the model. Now, we do not know exactly what he gave them. Did he give them a sketch? Did he give them just word instructions? We don't know. But they did have a plan, an authorized plan, as to how to make this tabernacle. One writer said, it sounds as if God intended to provide a visual representation of what he wanted the Israelites to build. Another writer, or this same writer, said that one said the plan for the tabernacle may have involved a vision. Another possibility, God gave Moses some kind of blueprint. We just don't know the details. But we know they had a pattern. So there was a pattern for the tabernacle. The scriptures devote more room to the description of the tabernacle and its furniture than to any other single subject. So that tells you how important it is. Number three, there was a pattern for the furniture of the tabernacle. So not only the tent itself, but the furniture that went in it. Number four, they were to make everything according to the pattern. Exodus 25 and verse 40, see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And we turned and read Stephen's statement in Acts 7, verse 44, and the Hebrews writer that dealt with make it according to the pattern. Now, little a, if the tabernacle is the place where God and man meet for worship, the latter to worship the former, man to worship God, it is imperative that this institution be spelled out intricately. Everything is made by, and I think I told you to underscore this, explicit command of God. Nothing is done on the ad hoc ideas of human architects. So explicit command, one of the ways the Bible authorizes. You don't have implication here. You have explicit command. Little b, another writer, in this way, the tabernacle sums up a basic biblical truth about religion. Mark it. It must conform to the will and nature of God. Now, that answers, I didn't like, I didn't get anything out of it. I think we need to change it to make it more appealing, more interesting, get more people. If it does not, if it's not what God said it was to be, to conform to His will, and his nature, you can do it all day and he won't accept it. You can call it worship, you can call it church, you can call it anything you want to. But God hears nothing when we offer that. So that is a very important principle. And that's true in the New Testament. Not just the tabernacle worship. He went on to say, much in the Bible exists to expose man's tendency to make religion suit his own pleasure 
or as might be said, match what he finds helpful. But if religion does not match the will of God, it's ultimately futile. And we read, I believe, Isaiah 29, 13. And I believe that's a key point as to where we are in our world today on worship. This entertainment, oriented, make it fun. What, what do you feel it ought to be? Like Willow Creek did and put out a survey and say what kind of church do you want and just take all that and amalgamate it into a big show because that's giving the people what they want. You give them what they want, they'll come. They may come, but they'll go to hell in a good humor because they are not doing what God said. So this we learn in principle with the tabernacle. Little c, once the raw material was gathered, the giver's freedom ended. They were not at liberty to decide the pattern or the use of the material. So no Israelite can say, hey, I made a contribution toward this. I want it built this way. I'm giving my money. I want it done this way. Once they gave, their liberty ended. That's true with us. Once we give to the Lord, if we have elders, they are to make the decision. Now, they're not good elders if they won't listen to the people. But the people don't make the decision. You don't vote on these things. The elders and deacons don't vote on it. The elders have that responsibility. If I don't like the way they spend it, I have a right to go talk to them about it. But I don't have a right to say, now, I gave... Now, you have to do it this way. That makes sense? So when the people gave, and we're going to spend a lot of time on their giving, their liberty ended with the tabernacle. Little d, one writer said, to mar the pattern would have spoiled the tabernacle as a type. So you can't mess it up. Little e, the only way Moses could build the tabernacle, underscore it, by faith was to build it exactly as Jehovah commanded. So I want to get this idea to us. It is God's command, God's, we'll call this revelation, that produces faith. Faith does not produce revelation. Without God's revelation, there can be no faith. Because we wouldn't know what to believe or how to believe. And I believe somewhere in the Bible, there's a scripture that says that. Anybody know where it is? Romans 10, 17. And what does it say? Faith coming by hearing and hearing the word of God. Okay. So if you don't hear God's word correctly, and you're not going to have correct faith. So faith comes from God's revelation. So Moses could not have built the tabernacle by faith if first of all God hadn't told him what to do and second he didn't do it. So faith doesn't give me liberty to change God's word. You have the same principle and I've preached on this but some of you are mere children. I dealt with Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. But you have the same principle, Noah building the ark. Build it this way. And the parallel, of course, Hebrews 11, 7. Without God's revelation, Moses would not have known what to do. See, you can do something, but if you don't do the right thing, God won't accept it. And you cannot know the right thing without the revelation. All right, questions or comments on the first nine verses? Yes. Uh, I know God has told them how to build it and what use the almond blossoms and things, but do we know as far as like a, is there a man's history of why it would be almond blossoms or a thing why he particularly wanted that way? You get to heaven? And if you get there before I do, run out and tell me. I won't have to ask that. But unless God explains it, we're on dangerous ground if we try to say, here's why he wanted this out of the 
And I know of no place where God said, this is why I want it done this way. Anybody know? I don't know of one. You know one? So, <clears throat> that's the same. You might say that's an arbitrary command of God. It's that he decides how it's going to be. And I obey that arbitrary command, though I can't make, not make any sense out of it. I don't see how this would contribute. Now, you have that same principle in baptism. I cannot explain how baptism washes away sin. I can tell you it does. I can't tell you how. Logically, I cannot put a connection. So that's an arbitrary command of God, where God, God can pick the way he wants it done. And if I respond by faith, I do it exactly the way he said, even though I don't understand why. Does that make sense? And we talked about Naaman. Naaman didn't understand why dipping in Jordan had any connection with curing leprosy when he had two better rivers in his mind in Syria. But when he dipped, he was cured. Or the brand serpent. Oh, yeah. And it's interesting, last year at PTP, one of my subjects involved using Old Testament examples to make clear. Bible passages that people argue about or have problems understanding. And I used Nathan. And one of my good friends, a gospel preacher, was in that class. <clears throat> and after class, he came up to me and said, I used Naaman to study my way out of the Baptist church. Hmm. So if you're studying with somebody on baptism, he said, I decided Naaman had to do it, and it worked for him. How could I refuse to do what God said when he said it worked? So powerful examples, as you mentioned, the bronze the, uh, serpent, that help people when you're studying with them, and they don't have their backs up when you go to the Old Testament using the illustration. They don't have anything to defend there. They can see the principle a lot of times. Then you can take them to the passage that they're disputing and say, now what's the difference? Here's the principle. That makes sense? So knowing the Old Testament sometimes will help you in teaching somebody the gospel. Very good. Any other questions or comments on the first nine verses? All right. In an attempt, like I said, to keep the material together, we want to go to Exodus 35 and look at the items to be made, verses 10 through 19. God gave them the pattern. Now what's going to be made? In verse 10, you have the workers. Exodus 35, verse 10. On page 80 of my Bible. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Exodus 35, 10. All who are, and do you have who are in italics in your Bible? Yes, and every wise. All right, is every wise in italics? All right. All gifted artisans among you shall come and make, what's that next word? A-L-L, -L, all that Jehovah has commanded. Now, wise-hearted, is that what you have, wise-hearted? It's from the Hebrew word called kalkon, this is A, which means intelligent, skillful, or artful. Skillful in various kinds of technical work. So you had to have people who knew what they were doing or at least had some talent in this area because Jehovah said that's who is to come and do it. So notice that in selecting the workers here, he is selecting people that already have some knowledge in the area of what's going to be done. Now that does make sense. So what's he doing? By doing that, what's he doing? Teaching the craft people. 
Bradley. That's correct. And why? What's the principle? Because I already have the full knowledge of what to do. All right. So you let people use the abilities they have in areas where they can work if possible. Some people are better song leaders than other people. Some people cannot carry a tune in a bucket. Some people cannot carry the bucket. Some people don't have a bucket. They make a joyful noise to the Lord, but they're not leaders. I think I told you about my friend Donovan Porter who held a gospel meeting in a place, little place. I think it was he and one or two other men when he got there, and they said, we don't have a song leader. You're going to have to lead singing. Don said, I can't lead singing. They said, you're going to have to. We don't have it. Don said, I picked out a song for the Bible class, and I stood up and started it. He said, I noticed there was an old man on the back row, had on bib overalls, that he stood up and just kind of meandered his way down the side of the building and down to the front row and sat down. And Don said, when we finished the first verse, he said, I ain't no song leader, but I can beat that. <laughs> and Don said he led singing for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> so you let people use the talents they have, and that's God's principle. The one talent man was not condemned because he had one talent. God expected him to use it. He was condemned because of him. The five talent man did not do two talent man work. He did five talent. And he had more ability. Because he was given the one talent, now he has eleven. He had the ability to do eleven talent. You with me? So elders, when you're finding people to do work, pick out folks who have a talent in that area and use them. Use them in that area. Let them work where they're good. And I believe you have a principle here for that. In verses eleven to nineteen, you have the work. You have a list of the things that are to be made. So verse 11, the tabernacle, its tent, its covering, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets. The word tabernacle in verse 11 refers to the inner linen curtains. Look at our chapter 36 and verse 8. Then all the gifted artisans among them who worked on the tabernacle made ten curtains woven of fine linen and of blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim. They made them. So here tabernacle is talking about curtains. That's what's involved in that word. The word tent in verse 11 refers to the goat's hair curtain. Look at chapter 36, verse 14. He made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. So the term tabernacle, same word as in 36 or 35, 11, refers to the entire structure. Thus the term tabernacle, Mishkan, had both a broad application and a specific narrow application. So how would you know to what it is referred? Which one? Which one? Immediate context. And that's what we did. So we went over 36, saw what they did. You're in your immediate area here. Make sense? Then verse 12, the ark and its, you may have staves, holes, with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering. Verse 13, the table and its holes, all its utensils, and the showbread. I believe that's King James spelled it S A T W. Okay, showbread. Verse 14, also the lampstand, you may have candlestick. For the light, its utensils, its lamps, and the oil for the light. Verse 15, the incense altar, its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, <coughs> excuse me, and the screen for the door. 
at the entrance of the tabernacle. Verse 16, the altar burnt offering with its bronze, you may have brass grating, <coughs> its bowls, all its utensils, and the labor and its base. We're going to look at these more in detail as we go through other parts. That's where they're being made. Verse 17, the hangings of the court, its pillars, their sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court. Verse 18, the pegs, you may have pens of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court, and their cords. If you look at number 11 on your outline, one writer said they must be regarded as tent pegs whereto were attached the cords which kept taut the covering of the tent over the tabernacle and which steadied the pillars whereto the hangings of the court were fastened. Now, what I want you to get this time through is detail. Get detail. He didn't just say make a tent. And you folks are skillful artisans. You know what to do. Go do it. He didn't say that. He said, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to make. Notice God's specificity. God is specific. Sometimes he'll give a generic command. Go preach. Go any way you want to. doesn't violate scripture. Preach the gospel specific. That's the only thing you can preach. But here he's specific. I want you to make this and this and this and this. And then we'll read. Here's how I want you to make it as we look at the detail. Verse 19, And the garments of ministry, you may have finely wrought garments, for ministering in the holy place. The holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. So there will be special clothing for the priesthood. Special clothing for the priesthood. Is this where the Catholic people just live? It what? The reading about the clothing that they wear. Yeah, the robes and the special anointing for certain offices, yes. And not only they, but other denominations also. Any of you ever watched Charles Stanley, the Baptist preacher from Atlanta, on television? In 1971, Charles spoke for our state FFA convention in Atlanta. And he said then, the reason he wore a robe was so he could wear his golf clothes on, on under it when service was over, he could hit the golf clothes. And I've never hunted golf, so that didn't feel much to me. It would have sang. <laughs> but yes, that's, that's where a lot of people get these special, they call them vestments, that the priest and so forth. All right, questions or comments on these verses that have to do with the workers and the work in general. We're looking at detail. We're looking at these specific items. These workers, they were inspired. Eventually, yes, we'll see that. Which allowed them to do their work precisely the way God said it. Yes. But first, when we're introduced to them, they're going to use their skills they already know how to use. The inspiration will allow them to use them correctly. So you have a combination here of what inspiration uses. That did that, inspiration did that with the apostles. They each had a different personality. They would have used different words about things. The Holy Spirit used what they used, but inspired them to be sure what they said was what he wanted said, or what they wrote was what he wanted said written. That's why. When you read Matthew and you read Luke and you find them using a word 
you want to go back and look at the original word because, for example, the, the needle type. Now we go through the eye of a needle. Right? Matthew uses the sewing needle, the Greek word for sewing needle. Luke uses the surgeon's needle when you suture. That's their vocabulary. Holy Spirit used their vocabulary, but he inspired them to write what he wanted written, the way he wanted written. That makes sense? And yes, you're correct. We will find later that they were inspired. Other questions or comments? Very good. All right, I am assuming, well, y'all know what that'll do to you, so I'll just outright state it. I think this is probably new ground for some of you. Is that right? You haven't really spent a lot of time dealing with these details. You're not in the boat by yourself. The majority of people I've known over 50 years of preaching haven't spent the time with it either. I think you will appreciate the lessons when we get through. But I want you to know it's minute. We're dealing with technical details. And the principle I want you to get is you have to get it. We've come to our day and age, which has passed me by, but this computer age, if you hit the wrong button, you're in trouble. I know by experience. And people who worked on my computer and I paid them to do it, I told them, you owe me money. Because I have gotten into predicaments you've never seen before, and you had to figure it out, and you learned from me. So you ought to pay me money. So it's the same thing. You, you hit the wrong button, you, you messed up. So you have to do it right. You have to learn it correctly. And that's what God is saying to these people. All right, then we want to move to Exodus 35, verses 20 through 29, and Exodus 36, 3 to 7. And we'll look at the investments for the things to be made. Now we're going to get down to how could they do this? Notice they're at Sinai. They've come out of Egypt. Do you remember what they brought with them from Egypt? They asked of their neighbors and got a lot of material. They brought out of Egypt, but they're going to use some of it. And you wonder, you know, why did they do that? But well, here's, the, here's the answer. They're going to use it, right? Here. So what God did when he said, go and ask of your neighbor, he not only is providing for the trip from Egypt to Sinai, He's making preparation for the tabernacle, so he's laying the ground. You don't see that, you get over it. So you look at their preparation. Chapter 35 and verse 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Now tie with that, verse 1. Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together. And said to them, These are the words which Jehovah has commanded you to do. Right? So he called them together, told them what to do, then what did he do? Sent them to do it. Sent them to do it. That ought to be our mindset when we gather for worship on the first day of the week. Let's adore and honor God. Let's learn from His Word what He would have us do. And let's disperse and go do it. How often do we sing to the work, to the work. And we leave the building and go to the house. 
that's where we sit. As far as our work for the Lord. The principle laid down in 35.1 and 35.20 is learn what God wants you to do, go do it. You remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus was raised from the dead he spent 40 days meeting with his apostles preparing them for what you're going to read in the rest of the book of Acts and in the epistles. And among the things he gave them during that 40, year, 40 day period was what we call the Great Commission. And when he ascended he said, you stay in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit, and then you go do it. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So you're going to stay in Jerusalem for a little while, but then you're going to leave Jerusalem. Go do it. Make sense? Principle. Make sense. So the children of Israel came and brought the things required for the work of the tent of meeting, and for all the service thereof, and for the holy garments, for all the work which Jehovah had commanded to be made by Moses. So look at 21, 22, and 29. 21. Then everyone came whose heart you have was stirred up, All right, literally lifted him up, whose heart lifted him up. And everyone whose spirit was what? Willing. And they brought Jehovah's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all its service, and for the holy garments. What would you say if you analyze that verse? Is the takeaway principle we need to learn. What's the message in that verse? <clears throat> Tell me again, I missed it. Okay. Heart crack. Flush. Flush that out. Well, we're willing to do what the Lord said to do. All right. Send me. We no. sing it, don't we? Send me. You have, you've never sung that? I've sung it in the pews, I know. Did I discuss the place of singing in that question? <laughs> Son, you were chasing rabbit We ain't even turned loose yet. That's what you do. <laughs> So one attitude is willingness to do what God said do. Does anybody else see anything else in that verse? Specifically, their willingness to give of the things that they do. All right, so that goes back to that willing heart, willing not only to do what God said, but to finance it. So they would have a good contribution that Sunday or that Saturday, wouldn't they? Finance this work. Anything else? Think of the joy containing the fellowship that they might be looking towards in the future. Joy in fellowship with fellow brethren. Somebody, somebody talked about that Sunday. So you have joy, joy, joy up in their heart as they bring and do. All right, anything else? That it was everyone. All right, you have, well, it's a qualified everyone. All right, everyone who had a willing heart, everyone whose heart lifted him up. But what about those who didn't have a willing heart? They didn't come. They didn't come. You see now why I advertise this class like I did? Come, you want to. That's what you want to. Anybody say anything else? 
All right, he came to do all the service, everything God wanted done. So you can preach out of one verse. Of course, I can do it for months. Some fellows can do it for one sermon. <coughs> Anything else? Nobody was made to do anything. All what kind of service? Free will. Free will. And when we get to Leviticus, we're going to run into an offering name there. Free will. So you come here, you don't have compulsion, you don't have conscription, you have willingness. And here you have volunteers. And you might call them brave volunteers. Whoever's heart lifts him up, whoever has a willing spirit, are the folks who came. Does this verse call anybody to mind in the New Testament in the matter of giving? First Corinthians 16. In the sense, Paul's taking up the contribution, but there he gives a, a command. As I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so also do you. The Macedonians. Yeah. The Macedonians, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Out of their deep poverty, which means they needed help, they begged to help the poor saints in Judea. Now their heart stirred them up, lifted them up, had a willing spirit. Now folks, you get a bunch of folks like that together to do the Lord's work, not only will there be joy, the work will get done correctly. That's, that's the spirit of the church. That's the Christian spirit. And there's no greater joy and no more fun than you'll ever have with anybody than working with that kind of folks and doing the Lord's work. So what we need to do at Smyrna is make sure we maintain that attitude and build it among our young people as we raise up another church. Not only do we want to do the Lord's will, we want to do it right. And we want, we enjoy doing it. It's not compulsory. It's not, well, I wish it didn't have to go. I wish it didn't have to do that. And I'm trying to change my terminology about attending service. You know, I grew up saying and hearing said, no, I can't do that. I have to go to worship. No, I get to go to worship. I don't have to. I go because I want to. That's what I meant all along. I was using bad terminology. We do that sometimes. Yeah. And we learn better. We learn. And we try to do better. All of us. So do you see that? All these things we all see. Right there in that one verse. Fellas, let them preach. Add your invitation, your introduction. You can go to town on that verse. David. All right, then notice in verse 22, they came, both men and women. What do you learn there? What? That's right. What did you learn there? That everybody was did their work. There was a work for men, there was a work for women. And you didn't have a woman standing around saying, well, I'm a woman, there's nothing for me to do. Ladies, this ties in Sunday morning a little bit in Bible class. Work of women in the church. Your work. And they were happy to do it. They came both men and women. Qualifying again, as many as had what? All right. And they brought earrings and nose rings, rings and necklaces, all jewelry of gold. That is, every man who made an offering of gold to Jehovah. 
see these folks running around with no dreams today think they've invented something. <laughs> so here, see, it's just old stuff come back. Colors keep your ties, they'll come back to style. I'll wear mine anyway. And you see a nose ring here. We must have a different model. I didn't see a nose ring either. Do what, old? First one of the Tiffany's not fair about it. You don't have a nose ring? No. What do you have? Notice this, and every man with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet, fine linen, and goat's hair, red skins, and browns, and badger skins, brought them. Right? Everyone who offered an offering of silver or bronze, you have brass, brought Jehovah's offering, and everyone with whom was found, do you have acacia wood here? Sure. You may have shittim wood there. For any work of the service, brought it. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun, a blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. And all the women whose hearts lifted them up, stirred them up, whose heart stirred with wisdom, spun yarns of goat's hair. All right, you have the women who are doing what they can do. Do you see here, people are bringing in abundance and they're bringing what they have. They didn't go to the store and buy this stuff. They already had it. And one of the ways they got it was out from the Egyptians when they left it. That may not be the only way, but that's at least one of the ways. All right, look at verse 27. The rulers brought onyx stones and the stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and spices and oil for the light, for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. All right, who brought it? Now, what do you see in that verse? For leadership. Leadership is doing what? Same thing. All right. They're in there working. Now, you folks have brought what you have. Here's what we have. We're bringing leaders. Does a congregation work well when the leaders lead and they're out there working with them? whole lot better than when they just direct and tell you what to do. means a lot. Turn to 1 Chronicles 29. Of 29. 1 Chronicles 29. They're collecting here, getting things together to build the temple. And verse 6. Then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, what do you have? Offered willingly. Here's your leaders. Here are your leaders. They're offering willingly. What do you think, folks? Now, if I get up and preach a sermon on giving liberally, 
And all of you know that I give a quarter every Sunday. What's that going to do to what I'm saying? Respect is what? It's earned, not demanded. And respect is earned by what people see you do, not what they hear you talk about. With me. So these these leaders are garnering the respect of the people by what they're doing. Here's a great lesson for leaders. <coughs> You don't have to do all the work. You aren't expected to do all the work. You have all these folks with talent and ability. And look, and they're putting it all together. But you need to be in there with them. We need to be in there with them. And doing our part. Doing what we can do. That makes sense. Turn to Ezra 2. I love these verses. 1 Chronicles 29, 6. Ezra 2, 68 and 69. When I preach on you. Now see, they've come back from Babylon and they have to rebuild the temple. They're building Zerubbabel's temple. Ezra chapter 2, 68. Some of the heads of the father's houses, when they came to the house of Jehovah, which is in Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to erect it in its place. Notice this. According to their ability. They gave to the treasury for the work 61,000 gold drachmas, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. If you mark in your Bible, verse 69, do you have according to their ability? After. after their ability. According to their ability. So they gave what they were able to do, and the folks knew what they were able to do. Those tell us when you preach on giving, two great verses or passages to use. All right, 22 to 28 show you that there was a variety of gifts. And each person brought what he had and what he could bring. You put it all together and allowed the congregation to supply the needs for the construction. They did not ask the Gentiles to supply the needs. The heathen. The congregation did. And I'm sure I have upset people over 50 years when I have said whatever a congregation makes up its mind it wants to do for the Lord, the money is there. We just need to get up off of it Money's there. You look at the cars we drive, the houses we own, the vacations we take, the things we spend on ourselves, and then turn around and say we don't have money. That won't work. And here your leaders are out front. They're giving. Everybody else is giving. They're bringing what they have. That just sounds a whole lot like Acts 2 and Acts 4, doesn't it? They sold their goods, parted among any as they had need. Sounds like 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. It's not according to what a person doesn't have, but what he does have, that God expects us to give. So don't ever look around and say, if I had their money, I could. No, 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 no. Just look inward and say, I have this money, I can. Here's what I can do. And all of us can't do what other folks can do. And the thing we need to learn about giving is our contribution amount may change from week to week depending on how we're prospering. There are some weeks I'm prospering more than I am other weeks. That ought to affect my contribution. Back when I used to go to tech ball games, I don't know if you still go, but they still do this. They'd get up on the rafter and they'd drop money over the student section, $5. And it just flowed on. You know, it didn't always stay in the student section. It 
let alone over where we were, across the court. And folks were catching that stuff. Enzo caught five dollars one night. And he's back behind me, and I'm down here, and he's showing it all. And I said, great, contribution go up to him. <laughs> and that's true. That's five dollars he didn't have before we went to that ball game. You see what I'm saying to you? You bring what you have according to the way you prospered. Isn't that the criteria given for second Corinthians? So people sometimes ask, you know, what should I give? Well, you should give as your prophet. That's what the text says. Out of, out of what you have, not what you don't have. Questions or comments? All right, go to chapter 36, verses 3 through 7. Are y'all seeing these principles as I go along? Am I rushing to it? you getting it? Stop me if I go too fast. All right, beginning verse 3. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they, what do you have here? continued bringing to him what? How often? Now look at that. They'd already brought. So what are they doing? They keep on bringing. Little A under two. They brought free will offerings which carry with them the idea of spontaneity. A spontaneous, abundant gift. And they brought every morning continually. The Hebrew there is in the morning, in the morning. That's the way the Hebrew would picture continuous. So they brought continually. Was that not in the evening too? Well, now my, my text says every morning. Okay. Now that's where I'm going to leave it right there in that verse. So they brought Continually. That's what I want you to get. Verse 4, Then all the craftsmen, craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing, and they spoke to Moses, saying, the, pre the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which Jehovah commanded us to do. Verse 7, for the material they had was sufficient. You have that word? For all the work, all the work to be done. And what? Too much. We talk about free will often. So they brought continually, they brought copiously. More than enough. Sufficient for all the work and too much. Too much is from a word which means to exceed, to excel, to remain or be left over, to leave, cause to overflow, abound, preserve. Look at Second Chronicles 31. Carrying out his royal reforms, reforms of the people. Beginning verse 6, 2 Chronicles 31. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt the cities of Judah, brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated to Jehovah their God, they laid in heaps. In the third month, they began laying them in heaps, and they finished in the seventh month. And when Hezekiah saw, uh, when Hezekiah, the leaders, came and saw the heaps, they blessed Jehovah and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priest and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offering into the house of Jehovah, we have had enough to eat and have, have, and have plenty 
left. For Jehovah has blessed his people, and what is left is this great abundance. Now, if you're taking notes, God's people serve a God who gives what? Leftovers. Have nothing leftovers. Sounds like the prophet will talk about his daddy, doesn't it? Leftovers. Feed 5,000 people. Take up 12 baskets of leftovers. Feed 4,000 people. Take up 12 baskets. Or seven baskets. Right here. Seven in that one, isn't it? Of leftovers. Leftovers. Abundant. You have satisfaction. You have sufficient. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had to get up on Sunday and say we have more money than we can spend? We have more money than we can find places to help. We're going to ask you to hold off for a little bit and cut back a little on your giving. Now, you have to give every first day of the week. That's commanded. But right now, we don't want to bank money. We don't want to bank the Lord's money. Church, not in banking business. But we've helped everybody we know. If you know somebody we can help preach the gospel or we can help them do the work of church, come tell us. We have money. It's running over. Isn't that a wonderful way to be? y'all believe we've almost been that way for about, what, the last 10 years? That's how good the giving is. Now, we haven't run out of places to help, but it's been wonderful that when requests came in that were worthy, that the elders could say, we can help that. We may not be able to take it on full time, but we can help We have the money. That's the way it all and here's your background principle. So they brought abundantly. They brought continuously. They brought copiously. And apparently the idea here is they brought so much that the workers were being hindered in building the tabernacle because they had to stop work and receive all the gifts that were coming. That just, that's wonderful giving. You preach on giving, fellas. There's your illustration. Seems like a cheerful time. Yes, sir. I mean, you'd have joy out of that, wouldn't you? <coughs> and you think about your people in charge, and you, if you go through what I've seen in 50 years, instead of looking around and saying, well, we're going to have to go to bank more money, you're saying, we can do that. Let's do that. Let's go. We have plenty. And that's the attitude we want to build in Christians. It's the attitude when, our, when someone obeys the gospel. We need to help them move toward that attitude and give. Man, we look at what God's given us. What excuse would I have for not giving? I'm blessed. Questions or comments thus far? We have looked at the contribution being continuous, and we have looked at the contribution being copious. Notice that this contribution, we could say, was voluminous. Some have estimated that approximately 2,756 pounds of gold were brought, 3824 with approximately 9,474 pounds of silver. So we'll turn to 38.24. All the gold that was used in all the work of the holy place, that is the gold of the offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels, according to the set shekel of the sanctuary. Verse 25, the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Now, we don't know what the shekel weight was. There are, there are guesses, but we cannot find and say definitively this is what a shekel of the sanctuary was. 
but they knew. So this this is an estimate. But you think about 2,756 pounds of gold, 9,474 pounds of silver. That'd make quite a pile, wouldn't it? Abundance. Abundance. Now, one of the things that ought to strike you here is how blessed these people were, and they're traveling. They left Egypt, and they're going to Sinai. They're supposed to leave Sinai and go to Canaan. But look what they have. <coughs> and you would think somebody would have this abundance would need to be living in a city somewhere, have full-time occupation. And how do you explain? How do you explain this kind of body? And they enslaved. They had been slaves. <coughs> they aren't now. They're excited. The Egyptians were very wealthy. That's how I make it. All right. And, and, that, and after they leave Egypt, they were a world power, right? No, they were a bunch of wandering nomads. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the Egyptians. Oh, yeah. The Egyptians were a world power. Yeah. After the Hebrews leave there, their power is no longer... You know, uh, you don't read that much about them in history being a world power. Wonder why? Well, I'm, I'm looking at it. They, I'm, I'm took it. they took a lot of their resources with them. And they, they destroyed their army in the Red Sea. No, their, their army, especially their pharaoh, apparently floating on the Red Sea. Yes. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah will provide him a sacrifice. Genesis 22. The only way you can, you can explain this, the only way you can account for it, is they serve a God who gives leftovers. That ought to encourage us. We serve the same God. And he had quick giving. So, what an what a encouraging to think about. That's our God. Everybody have all this you want? We'll see the children of Israel were able to bring these gifts because of Jehovah's provisions for them. So they received gifts when they left Egypt. They defeated the Amalekites, and they may have stayed, taken spoil from that defeat. And I've given you the passages in Exodus we've already studied. In chapter 36, verse 6, little d, they brought until they were commanded to stop bringing. Little e, one writer said, by this liberal contribution of free will gifts <coughs> for the work commanded by the Lord, the people proved their willingness, I thought this was a great thought, their willingness to uphold their covenant relationship with Jehovah their God. This liberality also demonstrates the grateful, obedient hearts of the Israelites at this point in their history. Think about grateful. They're grateful. But Paul say, let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving. Great. What prompts, what motivates me to give as I prosper? My gratitude to God. When I survey the wonders of Christ, that motivates me to give financially, to give of my talents, to give of my time, to give whatever I have. The cross is our motivator. Deliverance from Egypt was the motivator for Israel. They were delivered from slavery to Egypt. We're delivered from slavery to sin. It's a matter of deliverance. Salvation. That's our motivator. So, God says, look what I've done for you. Now, look what I've asked of you. And if you'll do it, look what I will do. So they're able and they do 
bring. And here they are keeping the covenant. They're living up to their covenant relationship with God. And it's my judgment that we as Christians sometimes lose sight of our covenant relationship. We don't think much about it. We don't think much about when we walk out of the ministry, we've entered into a covenant. And it's our responsibility to live up to our side of the covenant. And that will motivate us. Questions or comments? Right, verse 21 of chapter 35. Then everyone came whose heart lifted him up, and everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought Jehovah's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all its service, and for the holy garments. They brought at once, they brought their offerings immediately upon receiving instruction. In Hebrew, verses 21 and 22 both begin with, and they came. And one writer said this suggests the swiftness of their response. So unlike some of us, they didn't have to talk about it in six business meetings before they got it done. They came immediately. They responded. I mean, this is response to Jehovah saying, now here's what I want done, here's who, who I want to do it, here's what I need to get it done, or what I want to get it done, and they said, here it is. And that attitude is the attitude of Isaiah in Isaiah 9, here am I, send me. I'll go right now. And that's a marvelous thing, we brought it at once. Notice verse 6. They brought in association with each other. 5 and 6. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to Jehovah. And then you drop down to 36.6. So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. So they brought, in association with each other, 36.6, man or woman, they're bringing what we've read in 35, they're told, don't bring in more. Now, the proclamation of the commandment throughout the whole camp implied the whole camp was participating. So they couldn't just tell this segment or this segment and let everybody know. Or they just kept bringing. And yes, David, it little be that should be a no and not a zero. doing your work for you. So don't complain when I give you a date. <laughs> so you think about this working together. All right, verses 25 and 26 of chapter 35. All the women who were gifted artisans spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun, a blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. So they worked according to their ability. <coughs> what did God ask of them? What you can do. What did they do? What they could do. They used their ability. <coughs> So when someone places membership in the congregation, I try to give them a little sheet here that says, what will you do? Here are some things we do. And I often say, there's some things on here we aren't doing right now, but if we ever do them, are you willing to do them? Check this out. And really, 
really, we ought to get those sheep back. We ought to give them back every year and say, now, have you grown to where you want to be? Is there some other area in which you want to participate that you didn't check right here? Your says, you'll make announcements on Wednesday night. <laughs> okay. All right. Now you're making them on Sunday. So you've grown. I just happened to see that the other day when I was waiting for those points. You were probably 13 years old when you filled that out. It's been a while. But all of us would do well every year to look at ourselves and say, now have I grown to where I can participate in that area? If I have, do it. Do it. Do what you can do. But don't try to do something you know you can't do. Don't get a guilt complex and feel like you need to do something you're not able to do right now. I had a fellow one place I lived that I don't know how it happened. I wish I knew and could have headed it off. But he developed a guilt complex and he came to me and he said, I think I need to be doing more. I think I need to be leading the scene. Well, I didn't know whether he was on it or not. And I said, okay. And back then, I was not the secretary, so I said, go tell the elders what you're willing to do, and if they say that's okay, then go tell, and I told him who to tell, who did the work sheet. And he'll start putting you down. So he started standing up in front of us and starting songs. He was not a song leader. But he was trying out of a guilt complex. Not because he knew he had the ability, because he thought he ought to be trying something else. He ought to be doing more. I didn't have a heart telling me he wasn't a song leader. He was trying. And I knew the Lord was pleased with a joyful noise. But he really wasn't a song leader. And we all, because we loved him, suffered through his standing up and starting a song for a good long while. And one day he came to me and said, I'm not a song leader. And I've, I've been feeling guilty about this, and, and I just can't do this. And I said, you know, if you figured out that's something you can't do, I want you to know I appreciate you trying, but you need to go tell Brother So-and-so to take you off song. I was glad I was diplomatic. I loved him for trying. I would have never, if he'd lived to be 100 and I'd lived there, I'd have never said a word to him. But when he figured it out, we were all glad. And he moved on to do some other things. He had the ability. So I, I, what I'm saying to you is don't let what I'm preaching on here guilt you into doing something you can't do. That's not what I'm talking about. I've said over and over, they did what they could do. They did what they had the ability. And that's what we need to do. Does that make sense to you? Notice uppercase D. All could have a part in the work, and if you mark it in your notes, their contributions were considered of equal standing. One writer said, For observe, the women who spun goat's hair are placed side by side with the ruler who brought onyx stones and costly spices and jewels to be set in the high priest's breastplate. There was no differentiation about the importance of either gift. The man who made the pen, verse 18, was as truly a worker in God's service, should be, as Bezalel, who drew the plans. Those who work cooperated with one another to get the work completed. This must have been, Alicia, your joy here. This must have been an encouraging sight. Everyone joined his skill and ability to the one next to him. And it all fit together. So 
whoever makes the contribution of whatever, he's on equal standing with anybody else. I'm not any better or more important because I preach than you are because you clean the building, you open the door, you prepare the communion, whatever you do. None of us is that no one is any more important than anyone else based on what he does. We're just all trying to use our door. And that's the way we need to look at each other. Thank you for doing what you can. It means a lot. There are folks, unless they tell you, you never know it, that are sitting on that pew encouraging me and I know it took every ounce of energy they had to get to the church house and get to that view. They're doing what they can. And that's an encouragement. And I appreciate it. I taught a class like this one year, and we had what we have over here. We had those metal chairs. That was standard chairs for churches of Christ for 440 years. And I had a man in the class who had the worst case of arthritis that I've ever seen. And he would come every Monday night and sit two hours on those old hard chairs. And then he'd get the tapes of the class and he'd go home with his tape recorder and he and his wife would turn off the television and set that tape up there and listen to it again. And I don't know how many times they did that during the week. That, that's, how in the world would you ever think that's less than what I could do teaching the class? What an example. What an encouragement. Loving the Lord, wanting to learn his word, do what you do. So if, if you got a fellow here and all he can do is unlock the church building, that's a great service. You ever try to get in a locked church building? Pretty important work. Somebody to unlock the door. Or lock up the building after. Count the contribution. Or whatever you do. Be thankful for every work. Now there are some principles to be stressed. Here's your sermon, guys. Number one, the thing done was to Commanded by Jehovah of a KC. Notice Moses resolved to only do that which Jehovah wanted done. He was determined to act according to the pattern. So the first thing you decide is what did God say he wanted done? Once you've decided that, the second thing you decide is am I going to do what God said he wanted? The third thing you're going to decide is, am I going to do what God said he wanted done now? So what's the song? I am resolved no longer to linger. I will rise and go to my father. Younger son said, I'll go now. So number one, the thing done was commanded by Jehovah. So he had book, chapter, and verse as the way we say things for what he was doing. He had Bible authority. Number two, the thing done was carried out by workers whose hearts were right. You see three kinds of hearts in these verses. The willing heart, which is said to be a liberal heart. The wise heart, which is said to be a skillful heart and the submissive heart. All to Jesus, I surrender. Submission. So I will use my skill, I will be liberal in what I give, because I've submitted to God. I'm His servant. Number three, the thing done involved the contribution of the Israelites. They freely contributed the financial means for the construction. The 
contribution showed their commitment to make it according to the pattern. God said, bring this, that's what they brought. You don't see them saying, oh yeah, but I had this and I think you ought to take it too. You don't see that. God said, bring this, that's what they brought. The contribution respected God's command. Now, there are four, five, six great examples of giving that I want us to talk about. Great examples. You see that little D on your outline? Now I'm about to give you one, two, three, four, five, and six in parentheses if you're outlining correctly. Great examples of giving. Number one, the collection of David for the temple. We read that, 1 Chronicles 29, 6-9. These brethren brought. And it's interesting, David could not build the temple, but he collected everything that was going to be used for the building. You don't see him pouting and saying, well, if you'd let me build it, I'd get involved in this work. But since I can't build it, I'm not going to do it. He collected all the things Solomon was going to use. And then prayed for Solomon, which is the most you can do for him. So that's a great example of giving. Second, the giving for the repairs of the temple in the days of Joash. 2 Chronicles 24, 4 15. They had let the temple go into disrepair, which was a reflection on Jehovah to the nations about them. And they had done that because they were neglecting God's will. And Joash said, let's build this temple right. Let's fix it. So they did. You know, I understand why sometimes the congregation may dwindle and decide we need to close the doors. Have you ever driven by a church building where they've done that? It just, it just sits there and goes down. It's all in. Sad. I'd just really rather they tear it down if they can't use it than to let that happen. It just breaks your heart. You know, you're sad, number one that they couldn't continue, but I understand that sometimes it's better to merge. But then you're sad to see that bill. Stood there for a great light for the years that it's been there. And now it just decays. So they said, let's repair this temple. Third, the reformation of the offerings by Hezekiah. We read about Hezekiah doing that. His royal reforms, bringing the people back to God. Great example of giving. Number four, the collection for the rearing of Zerubbabel's temple. And we read Ezra 2, 68 to 70. We read 68 and 69. You would add to that Nehemiah 7, 70 to 72. Five, the widow, Mark 12, 41 to 44. Jesus sat over against the treasury. He watched all the wealthy people put in out of their wealth. And when you preach on that, fellas, don't criticize those wealthy people. Jesus didn't criticize them. The implication is they were giving. They were giving right. Their giving had no flaw in it. They were just blessed. And then here's the widow who came and put in how many mites? Don't, don't let folks talk about the widow's mite. 
put in two mites, and how did Jesus summarize her giving? She gave all she had, but how did he summarize it? She gave more than the She's given more than the rich folks did. He wasn't criticizing the rich folks. He's just saying they didn't give everything they had, but she did. Now, she had to have given it with the prospect in her mind that God will bless me and I'll be able to continue to live. If not, they would have to help her out of that treasury into which she was given. That was the treasury to help for her. So here's a poor person, like the Macedonians, who said, I may be poor, but there are other folks worse off than I am. I can help. You got all this you want? You can tell I'm out of space on the slide, but I'll leave it there for anybody that needs it. Just tell me. Right? Oops, I didn't put the other one on the slide, so I might just keep it. Number six, the Macedonians. Second Corinthians 8. The Macedonians. Drop it down under widow there, and I didn't see that it had come up on the slide. Second Corinthians eight, eight, second the chapter. Second Corinthians eight, and the key for successful giving of these folks is their hearts were in their giving. They put their hearts in it. And then the money just didn't have a, cho a choice but to pop. Have I lost you? So six examples, great examples of giving. Questions or comments? Little E on your outline. One writer said, what an example for us. Church debts. Fettered missionary enterprise, ministers of the gospel converted into persistent yet unsuccessful beggars. What are the Lord's people doing when such phenomena abound? Do we not need to be reminded of the privilege offered us, which is so fearfully profaned? Do we not need to stir up our hearts and to take active measures to make our spirits willing? The roused heart loosens the purse strength. Only the willing spirit can offer the willing and generous gift. Some of y'all don't know what he's talking about and much of that. But part of it he's talking about missionaries who come back to the States to report and during their time overseas they've gotten letters from churches that said we will not renew our support next year. So they've lost that amount of support. So when they come home to report, they're going around trying to raise what they lost, and then trying to raise enough to keep up with inflation when they go back. And they often go and speak with elders and their pleas are just falling on their ears. And they're going overseas. Doing without with their families and that's tragic it's really sad I appreciate the fact that we've tried to help even if we couldn't take on their work at least try to help do something to encourage number four on your outline Roper observed if someone is tempted to think of the Old Testament law as external and of those who were under it as being motivated solely by fear of obliteration, he should reflect on the willing participation of the Israelites in the contribution for the tabernacle. Some people say the God of the Old Testament was a God of retribution, a God of punishment, and the people lived under fear. That's what motivated them to serve. That won't fit the context. Some people say, you know, the old law was the law written, have you heard it? On stone, and the New Testament is a law written on the heart. On the heart. That won't fit either. 
we've just seen, whose, whose heart lifts him up. Here's heartfelt religion. So don't let folks put God in that box. You have the same God in the Old Testament you have in the New Testament with the same attitudes, the same mercy, the same grace, the same justice. Jesus Christ, the same. That's what the Hebrews writer said. But yesterday, today, and forever. So it doesn't change in character. What changed? What? Law and the priesthood. Priesthood law. Priesthood changed. So the law changed. So you change cut. Where, where is that? Hebrews 7 12. Okay. Hebrews 7 12. That's a key verse. Doesn't his presentation change from the Old Testament to the New Testament? His what? His presentation. What are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking about Mount Sinai to uh, the Sermon on the Mount. I'm thinking about there at Mount Sinai where. They have this miraculous scene of God, and here is Jesus Christ incarnate, God, and he's, he's there giving the spiritual lesson, and, and not in this bold atmosphere like he's at Mount Sinai, but he's the spiritual atmosphere that he's speaking to the people. Blessed, you know, it's just totally, totally different to me. Okay. It looks different. Okay. His presentation is different. Okay. Uh, you know, of course, I know he's trying to get across to the people. They just come out of slavery in Egyptian bondage, and you know, here they are at Mount Sinai. He's, he's trying to say, well, "I'm going to prove you." I think it says something like that in Exodus uh, twenty. We're at Mount Sinai. Let me read that. Okay. And then we go to the Sermon on the Mount, where it's just so calm. And then we have this uh, at Mount Sinai. It says in Exodus 20 and 20, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you and that this fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. Jesus, Jesus come as a humble man. Totally different. The presentation. Okay. Turn to Matthew 3. Okay. I see what you're saying. I see why you're thinking what you are. Okay. Let's start reading verse 1. Verse 1. And in those days John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophets Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make the path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then he went out to him in Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our fathers, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to rise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, thereof every tree would bring it not for good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, 
but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his weed into the garner. But he that will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. All right, what kind of presentation was that? That's pretty strong. There's a strong now, presentation of who is coming. Now, there's the background of the crowd whom he's teaching right. in Matthew 5. Right. So, on Sunday, God presented himself in a way to command their awe and their respect and their understanding that he's a holy God. In Matthew 3, John presented Jesus in a way to command the respect of national Israel, to remind them, you're not faithful to God. And if you don't repent, God's going to come and thoroughly destroy Jerusalem and winnow it like a chaff. That's a strong presentation of God is holy. You're to be in awe and respect of God, which you are not. I understand what you're saying. The, the way it appeared on Sunday is not the way it appeared with John. But the principle of appearance or presentation is still there. You're correct about there being a different sight, different sound, but you have the same principle. You have the same reasons behind it. Right. That you need to you need to come back and realize who God is. That makes sense? Yes. So I understand exactly what you're saying, you know, and I see why you would say that. Good comment. Anyone else? All right, let's look at 31, 1 through 11, and 35, 30 through 36, 3. This is Roman numeral 5 on your outline. I told you I was trying to get all the light stuff together for you as we go through. We won't read it twice. We'll cover it as we go through. So now we're going to look at the individuals themselves. We've seen what is to be brought and what is to be made. Now who's going to do it? So it boils down to that. Notice A under 5. The discussion about the workman in chapter 35 goes right on to 36.7 or at least the 36.1. Possibly one reason for the separating of chapters 35 and 36 at the point where they're divided was the faulty translation of 36.1 in the Greek Bible, that be your Septuagint, which is followed in the King James Version. It translates the verb work as a pass, an error. So he says wrought. The Hebrew very plainly gives it as a future, a perfect, with a ball consecutive, which should be rendered shall work. So you look at 36.7, for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. The work to be done. Future. And then you look at uh, 36 and 1, Bezalel and Aholio, and every gifted artisan in whom Jehovah has put wisdom and understanding to know how to, how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that Jehovah has commanded. So it's the idea, it hasn't been done, it's being done. So this writer says that may be why the chapter was divided. We won't know till we get to heaven and ask. B under, <coughs> excuse me, Roman number five. This is introductory to the entire subsection which extends to the end of chapter 39. So the end of 39 is when the construction is completed. Chapter 40, they rear it. So all of this is fit together. Now we go to 31. And we notice in verse 1, the authority behind the work is Jehovah. 
Then Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, drop down to verse 6, And I indeed, I have appointed with him a holy of the son of Ahizamot of the tribe of Dan. I'll tell you how these names really ought to be pronounced. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that, notice it, I have commanded you. Drop down to verse 11. And the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Look at chapter 35 and verse 30. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, Jehovah has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Jehovah has called him by name. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, this is what Bobby mentioned earlier, in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. And then he goes on to tell why. Notice the authority behind this work is Jehovah, not Moses. Not Aaron. Not any human. So, number one, they were not without direction as to what to do. The commandment of Jehovah settles the matter of direction because it provided the proper standard, if you mark by which the faithfulness of the workers could be measured. Now, you want to know whether or not you're faithful. This revelation provides a standard. Now, you measure you by the standard. And if you're doing what the standard says do, Then you're faithful. So how do you find out whether a Christian is faithful or unfaithful? Can you know? I would maintain that in some cases you can know and in some cases you cannot know. You can measure by what you see, but you aren't with them 24 hours a day. So some of the people that might say, I was faithful, if they had to go home with me and live with me 24 hours, might say I was unfaithful. And you see, what determines it is not what I think about you. It's the standard. Now, I can confront you if I know you violated the standard. That's what Paul did to Peter in Galatians 2. That's what he was told to do the elders who would not be faithful in 1 Timothy 5. That's what he was told, what he told the, the uh, Thessalonians to do, 1 Thessalonians 5, other passages. But you may be unfaithful, and I don't know. I may put on a good show around you. I may fool you. I may fool all of you. I think Lincoln is credited with saying, and of course Lincoln is credited with saying a lot of stuff he didn't say, probably. But you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. See, God knows. Now, when I preach a funeral, what I have to say is, I'm talking to you today from what I saw, from my standpoint. That as far as I know, this brother, this sister was faithful. The fact of the matter is, two people knew. The one who died and God. And it's all measured right here. So if I pronounce you faithful, that doesn't mean you're faithful. If I pronounce you unfaithful, it doesn't mean you're unfaithful. This is what settles. So if I can go to you and say, now brother, Here's what the text says. Here's what your lifestyle is. They don't fit. You aren't faithful in this. You need to repent. I can do that. But I cannot pronounce a judgment on the entirety of your life. 
Because not on what you think. Nancy doesn't know what I think. Only God knows that. Because you, you may not believe this, but I don't say everything I think. Just most of it. And my face doesn't exactly show everything I think. Just most of it. But only but God knows for sure. But there's one of those judges, whether you know it or not. Yeah. There's one lawgiver, and that's yeah. what James tells us in, in James uh, 4 and 11. Speak not evil of one another, brethren, but he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil to the, the law and judges the law, but if, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So you just push God right out of the situation. What he's dealing with in James 2 is prejudice, right. favoritism between the rich and the poor. Right. And how we treat them. It's real and equal. You get that point? So the standard determines faithfulness. All I can do is tell you what I see. What I observe. So they were directed in what to do. Number two, Jehovah had been explicit in his directions for the tabernacle. There could be no doubt as to what he wanted to do. Number three, each worker would give account for his work, mark it, to Jehovah. One writer said, number four, thus it was to be made plain to the then living generation and their successors that the tabernacle and its contents were in a very important sense the work of God. These things were to be sacred in every way. They were not to be criticized and compared as if they were the outcome of art and man's device. Now I can say that in South Florida language. When God says here is how it's to be, it don't matter what I think about it and whether I like it or not. God said it. You finished it. That settled it. Psalm 119, 89. That's what happened here. Questions or comments on what we...